All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. We are recording late Sunday evening winners and outright prices on the women's side. And then uh, we will, or rather Drew will, uh, give us some insight into the matches uh, on Monday in New York. But let's start off with the NFL, Drew. Week, se- uh, week three of preseason. Any big takeaway from you? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Drake May uh, is your new starting quarterback for the New England Patriots. Uh, sounds like injury and performance and comfortable, you know, injury for Brissett and performance and, and kind of comfort in the system that they're trying to run is going to be enough for them to uh, throw him out there week one against the Bengals. Decent soft landing spot. Bengals defense not especially scary with that, you know, as currently rostered. So that's going to be fascinating. Um, and I think uh, ultimately the Patriots look like uh, a little bit of an upside team with their win total at the uh, in the kind of the four and a half range right now. But, um, you know, that's basically counting on the defense uh, having uh, as much of an impact as they have in years past. And that is still a little bit of a question mark with the subtractions of uh, Barmore due to the blood clots and uh, Judon due to the trade. So, um, yeah, Patriots are, are going to be an interesting team the first four weeks of the season. They are going to be outside of a touchdown dogs three times. And so as a player who tends to gravitate towards dogs, they're I'm a moth to the flame <laughs> for the Patriots. So uh, going to be uh, fascinating to uh, kind of handicap that game, particularly that week one against uh, Cincinnati, who there are still some questions swirling, although it does sound like uh, Jamar Chase is less likely to miss that game than, um, you know, there were times that felt like late last week where it seemed um, if they didn't get a contract situation done, he may miss. Well, he, re- he was at practice today. And so maybe the hold in is ending there for Chase. Um, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the the Patriots quarterback situation finally has a little bit of um, uh, clarity. And uh, I don't think that Justin Fields played well enough to unseat Russell Wilson as the starter in Pittsburgh. And so Russell Wilson has your presumably high floor, low ceiling uh, job there in Pittsburgh with a very good defense and a very, very meh offense. Uh, And I think ultimately that's probably a job that he will have not a difficult time losing, even though they start the season relatively soft. Um, You know, there could be a couple of uh, hiccups for them uh, early enough in the season that uh, they kick the tires on Justin Fields if things aren't going well. Um, I am still very cool on Pittsburgh's offense and Pittsburgh as a whole. Uh, and I think uh, Wilson, you know, it's, it's just, it, I, I, I'm just not ceiling, seeing a ceiling that, uh, you know, some of the people in the market are, are keen to, uh, you know, kind of envision there. So Pittsburgh, a little cool on. Patriots a little intrigued by. And then, uh, you know, everybody else that had a starting role Cardi Cardi clearly well defined, but was in a new role, was in a new system. Um, looks great. <laughs> we'll start with Geno Smith uh, in in Ryan Grubb's system in Seattle. He looked very comfortable. Seattle's offense was clicking on all cylinders. Mike McDonald's press conference, he was like having trouble containing his glee. It felt like as he was like answering questions about how the offense looked because we were expecting to see Geno Smith for a couple series, Jay. And he threw five passes in his first series, scores a touchdown, and they were like, well, I guess he's feeling good. That's enough. Let's let's get him out of there. We don't want to risk an injury, Uh, which is, I think, uh, kind of a clear sign that that staff is feeling good about where they are as an offense. Uh, And then, uh, you know, similarly, you can point to, um, you know, what happened with Will Levis, I think, in Tennessee. Uh, you know, he had, you know, perfectly, Lee looked pretty comfortable in that system. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, kind of a, a, you know, a situation worth monitoring of how, uh, that offense was going to be able to kind of hit the ground running this year. And, um, I mean, it doesn't, it's, I don't want to make too many broad sweeping conclusions. There was a lot of points scored this weekend in, in, uh, uh, in the third week of the preseason. Um, and offenses in general look pretty darn comfortable pretty darn good and i know they're up against third and fourth string defenses and you know the teams themselves were finally starting to use some concepts that weren't just flat out vanilla uh, nonsense and so for those reasons offense looked a little bit little bit better um but basically everybody who you wanted to see who is going to be having meaningful minutes in week one um looked pretty good i thought and uh i think uh, that has me hopeful that uh, the quality of football out of the gate is a little better than what we had last year yeah so a couple of things that um you touched on the first one is with Uh, the Patriots. And I think that a big thing that people often get trapped in is just not being able to 
um, visualize or conceptualize like the amount of randomness and variance there is in the NFL year to year. Um, it's like when I tell people that like my favorite uh, futures bet this season is Dave Canales to win coach of the mm. year at 20 to one, 22 to one. And the, the answer I always get is, well, but yeah, but like the Panthers aren't going to make the playoffs. It's like, well, yeah, probably not. But <laughs> there only needs to be like a 10% chance for that to happen, for it to be a really good bet, in my opinion. And that's just what happens in the NFL is that if you can just kind of reach a baseline of competence, like the <laughs> Minnesota Vikings two years ago were like a bad, well, they weren't bad, but they were like a slightly below average team and they went 13 and four because they were a bit lucky. <laughs> Uh, the Giants <laughs> weren't that good two years ago, and they went nine, no. seven, and one, and then won a playoff game. Like, if you can just get yourself into the ballpark of competence, you can just ride not even like super outlier luck, but just a bit of fumble luck, some turnover variance, some luck in one score games. And all of a sudden, if you're playing to a six or seven win standard, then you can get carried to nine or 10 wins. And I think the Patriots are kind of in that group where people just look at that team and they see, Oh, well, Matthew Judon's gone uh, and the offensive line is really bad. It's like, well, Matthew Judon like wasn't part of the team for most of last year. He got hurt. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that like, I would just rather have Christian Gonzalez than Matthew Judon on that team. They missed both yeah. of them last year. They get Gonzalez back. Judon is gone. And it was an elite defense in the back half of the season. Uh, and I think can can be one again. And then on offense, yeah, the offensive line, doesn't look great, um, but let's see how it looks in regular season action. Let's see if it's Drake May who's the quarterback, which looks like it probably will be now to your point with Brissett. Don't know how bad his shoulder injury is. We're recording like late second quarter, um, but yeah, yeah, there's just a lot of variance there. Uh, and there are worlds where like people think the Patriots like definitely going to be bad and yeah, they'll probably be bad, but like I wouldn't be shocked. It wouldn't be shocking if they went nine or eight and there are ways to bet into that variance i think between like gerard mayo's 40 to one to win coach of the year like i'm sorry he can't be 40 to one to win coach (laughs) when they're like eight to one to make the playoffs and they won four games last year and everyone thinks they're gonna suck i think if you made me choose between patriots and panthers despite the fact that you have a much clearer vision that the patriots have a good unit on defense the schedule is enough for me to be more bull Panthers than it is to be bull Patriots. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you saw with the Panthers. Did you watch the drive we got with Bryce Young? I say that because I really wanted to see him like four or five series. We got one. It was a little bit of the same thing with Geno Smith, where although I thought Geno Smith, you've seen enough of him that just you know, being comfortable in the system was enough for them to kind of pull the, uh, uh, you know, pull pull the ripcord on him in that game. But Bryce Young, I would have liked to have seen more. And they only got that one series. And from reports, it has not sounded like they've had an especially physical camp, which means not a lot of like kind of real game speed reps for these guys. Um, but I think that one series he got, it certainly looked a lot better than what we saw from him last year. Um, do you are you getting a sense of what's going on in Carolina as this is a team that actually does have upside based on uh, you know sort of the way that they've I guess somebody said this quite well who I was talking to this weekend they've torn torn Bryce Young down to the studs and rebuilt him uh, from the ground up and uh, it, it do you are you kind of there with uh, where they are in their their progression or do you think that uh, it's going to take I don't know maybe four or five weeks before the Panthers are a bet on week by week. I mean, we'll see. I mean, the thing with the Panthers is their first 10 weeks are like obscenely easy and like no yeah. game's going to be easy for them because they're not very good. They're probably not going to be very good, but that certainly helps. I think that just from a Bryce Young perspective, and it's difficult to get too in the weeds on this, but like if I were betting the Panthers, which I am and via Canales at least, like I would prefer that the easy games be at the start because Bryce Young want him to get off to a good start um, because it seemed like a lot of what was going on last year was mental where he's got in his own head a little bit. I mean, in terms of the drive, um, I mean, yeah, it's a tick, but you can't read too much into it. It's just good that he didn't go out there and was terrible. I have heard that at Panthers camp that they are um, they are very happy with what Bryce Young has shown and they're very confident Um in Bryce this season, which, you know, we'll see what that means. But I think internally there is confidence that he is going to take a step forward. They've clearly put him him in as much of a position to succeed 
as possible with spending all um, their resources on the offensive line and bringing in Deontay Johnson and drafting Xavier Leggett. I don't really know that Leggett is like the perfect guy for uh, Bryce Young in year one, given that Leggett's issue in college was that he didn't separate that much. It's just difficult for those guys to really um, make an impact in the NFL straight away unless you're DeAndre Hopkins. Um, So we'll see. But overall, yeah, like if I had to bet my life on how many wins the Panthers are going to have this year, it'd probably be six. But if you get the six, then with yeah. an easy schedule, like doesn't take a ton to go from six to end up at nine. Um, and yeah, I think if they're nine and eight and just seven seed in the playoffs, they go from two wins to nine wins. I think Dave yeah. Pinellas is your coach of the year. Sure. Um, before we move on to the tennis ball, last couple things. Uh, and you touched on both of them. I think the two teams that I am highest on relative to expectation and not like talking about, you know, betting, um, in my mind, mispriced tail outcomes for teams like the Patriots and the Panthers, but just in terms of median outcome, the two teams that I'd be highest on relative to the market um, would be the Titans and the Seahawks. And that is largely because of the coaching changes and what they have shown in preseason and all the um, upgrades that they made personnel-wise. And I just, like their win totals right now, the Seahawks win total is seven and a half and the Titans win total is six flat. I just think they're going to go over. I just think those two teams (laughs) are better than that. I believe in McDonald and Callahan. And so those are probably the two teams I'm most excited um, to see in week one. Um, Because I think they're both, I think that I feel pretty good about the Seahawks um, you know, being a nine win team, nine, 10 win team, making the playoffs. And I feel good about the Titans being a frisky seven, eight or nine win team um, yeah. and competing for the playoffs. Yeah, we agree a hundred percent on that. They, those are the two teams that are sort of in that third quartile right now. If you kind of look at the NFL in, you know, eight, 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 well, the Titans and Seahawks are kind of in the middle and bottom of that third quartile, and I could very clearly see them slide up to the second based on, uh, you know, not just the additions they made personnel-wise, the coaching changes, which both so far seem to be positive, um, but uh, they also have like legitimately good veterans who missed a lot of time last year due to the injury and or you know we're just kind of off performance wise last year who look great so far in the season and i will key on left tackle charles cross for the seahawks who is winning his 1v1s consistently uh, across these joint practices for the seahawks which you know if you know if you're getting you know all pro level left tackle play that can absolutely help anchor an offensive line that was very much in need of improvement from last year uh, and then on the defensive side for the titans like jeffrey simmons looks like he's back and Jeffrey Simmons was like Aaron Donald light uh, until he got hurt. And I think realistically, like, you know, the fact that they these teams have bona fide players makes me more inclined to believe in the upside. Whereas like the Panthers, you know, where we were just talking about at length, like I, I'm I am I'm not out on the Panthers because I have decided that Bryce Young is not the guy and he'll never be the guy like we don't know what to expect from him this year. He could take a huge step forward, but there are still a lot of problems with that roster <laughs> broadly. Whereas, like, who's the best defensive player besides Derek Brown? I, I, Horn, Clowney. Is Clowney going to play? <laughs> like, is he yeah. well? Like, I, I don't I, like. There's lots of questions about the defensive side of the ball, and in fact, like, half tip to that front office for. I thought they picked Seattle's pocket, take it, getting yeah. Michael Jackson uh, at awesome. cornerback. That was a really nice move. So you now may, maybe they'll they'll it's like surprise to the good on the defensive side of the ball. I like Ejiro Evero as a coordinator, but um, yeah, for sure, Titans, Seahawks, like these teams have like bona fide good middle, you know, like in their prime talent uh, that I think you have to acknowledge, uh, and uh, that could be enough to help uh, help them, you know, kind of uh, see some upside this year. Yep. No, I uh, I agree there. Um, and the last thing before we move on to the tennis is Drake May's offensive rookie of the year odds. You know, as we're speaking, they are cratering, which makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it looks like he'll be the starter now. He was, I mean, like a week ago, he was thirty-five to one, um, which yeah. was crazy. And now he is. Number. It's like 
is the things like last week he was 35 to one. Like what did, what did people think was going to happen? Did they think that he was not going to be like firmly in the mix to be the starter after what happened in the uh, previous week's preseason games and how bad Brissett looked. And now he's 14 to one to 16 to one. And I think there is still a little bit of meat on the bone there just because like he was the third pick in the draft. He's quarterback. There were two other teams who wanted to trade up to get him. There is at least some people think that he is potentially very good. And I think he's a high variance quarterback as well, which is what you'd want um, betting these type of prices. And look, I don't think that I think that Caleb Williams should be the clear favorite. I think Jane Daniels should be the second favorite. I think that May has an argument to be the third favorite, like right there with Marvin Harrison Jr., just head to head. And like May is double yeah. the price of Bo Nix. I, I just think Drake May is more likely to win odds agnostic than Bo Nix because he has more upside and more variance. So look, I get it. Like doesn't have great weapons, doesn't have a great offensive line. Um, but if he is just really good, then a lot of that stuff changes because people <laughs> think that CJ Stroud had good weapons or a good offensive line. And I don't think Drake May is going to be rookie CJ Stroud, but there are worlds where May could just be very good from the get-go. Yeah, I agree with you. And what one week ago, Jay, we let off this podcast talking about Drake May. And the commentary was he went from a 1% chance of starting to like 50. And now he's gone from 50 to like 95. <laughs> so uh, yes, his price should very much reflect that. And it has taken a long time to get there. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, I definitely think that, you know, the, and I'm and I'm prepared to die on this hill, and we're going to bring this up a lot this season because there's a lot of things to talk about the Bears. <laughs> but I just, I'm never going to be on the Caleb Williams train this year. It's be, the expectations are way too high the way they are every year in Chicago. And uh, while, you know, certainly there are improvements on this roster generally, um, they've had a bad camp from the standpoint of a healthy offensive line. And, uh, you know, I, from what it's, I've heard about the Patriots offensive line, it's coming together. <laughs> like, this doesn't sound like the unmitigated disaster that was the consistent beating up the drum last year that really unwound that whole offense. So, um, yeah, I... I I'd rather have May than uh, than Williams at price for sure. I'd yeah. much rather have May than Nix. I think Nix is a very low ceiling player, and uh, you know him. Like if Nix wins this award, it is because everyone else stunk out loud. Period. And there yeah. is just too many really good rookies for that to be the reality. So um, Nix would be my very last choice, and I think Daniels. <clears throat> I, I bet some Daniels at in the seven fifty range because I just I, I didn't see the the gap between him and uh uh and williams the way the market did and uh ultimately like i'm going to be standing at the awards banquet <clears throat> watching the rookie of the year being announced and i'm going to have every ticket in my hand except for caleb williams <laughs> and i'm going to be sweating till the very death i think so uh we shall see but uh i don't know man i, I just see the bears are going to lose more games than people realize and i think that's going to hurt his chances yeah, and look, he, he, we can acknowledge that he's still the most likely player to win, but I can't really buy that he's like a 46% chance to win the award or whatever the <laughs> current market price implies it is. So you just have to you just have to be against him at that point until perhaps the price becomes value uh, later in the season. All right, draft like a champion using the Roto World Fantasy Football Draft Guide, now available exclusively through a new partnership with Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Roto World Draft Guide plus Fantasy DFS and betting tools to help you dominate all season long. Use promo code ROTO10 for 10% off. Go to fantasylife.com slash rotoworld to learn more. Uh, we'll talk much more Aroy uh, as we get closer to week one and into the season. But for now, let's pivot to Flushing and the US Open on the women's side. Um, these quarter markets are often quite soft uh, and exploitable. Um, uh, is there anything to exploit uh, this tournament, Drew? Yeah, let's uh, let's go through it. Um, the, we want to start, let's start with the women's side, and I will kind of uh, paint the picture of the way I see every quarter, and uh, we'll kind of call out what, what I think is value. Um, quarter one is the quarter of death. 
this is an absolutely a loaded quarter. Not only do you have the best player in the world, Aniga Sviantek, who's by all accounts, her game uh, plays very well to the type of conditions that we have seen through qualifying so far at the U.S. Open uh, and is the rightful favorite to win this tournament. Uh, but her quarter is very, very tough. You have not just the kind of best current best form American player in Jessica Pugula as the second seed uh, in this quarter, but you have some of the best young women uh, on tour, including Mira Andriva and Diana Schneider. Now, the other kind of, you know, kind of uh, names at the top of this board, Daniel freaking Collins, Emma Raducanu, Ludmilla Samsonova. Like these are also still very, very good players. And I could see, uh, you know, kind of any one of these six uh, ultimately coming through here. Um, but at price, uh, I'm a Diana Schneider fan. 12 to one is a huge number. I know she's going to have to go head to head with Iga, but I do like in general her game for kind of frustrating Iga. Uh, and uh, just in general, like, this is a very, very, very tough quarter. And for, you know, what Iga is, has a bully mentality. Like when things are going great, like get the heck out of the way. She is going to ruin your day. Um, but uh, if she is up against a kind of a meaningful foe, Mira Andreeva in round four looks like, you know, that type of foe. Dana Schneider in the quarterfinals looks like that type of foe. Uh, then, uh, you know, these young women could very, very well test her. Pagula, less interested in being against Iga if it's Pagula, Iga in the uh, quarterfinals there. Um, but uh, yeah, quarter one is the quarter of death. And at price, I would take a, a swing on Miss Schneider. Uh, who I think is primed to absolutely break out at this tournament. Quarter two is the weakest quarter. Uh, actually, I think quarter two and quarter three are both quite weak. I don't think there's really anyone who could ultimately win this title coming out of those two quarters. Elena Rubakina uh, has made some changes to her coaching staff, which I think ultimately will bear fruit as she goes into the future. Uh, but she does not look anywhere close to physically ready for this particular tournament and this grind. Uh, the second choice uh, in Jasmine Paolini, at least second ranked player in Jasmine Paolini, has a murderer's row. Uh, just to get to the second week of this tournament and I think is live to be popped relatively early. Uh, Naomi Osaka is sort of the the player who has been a little bit overlooked, I think, by the market. I know she has not delivered on the expectation that she was going to emerge during this hard court swing as just a dynamite force. But I will never forget the quality we saw from her at Roland Garros in the second round. And if she can manifest that at all, that she is coming through this quarter cleanly. And if it's Iga versus Naomi in a semifinal, I will happily have a bigger ticket on Naomi than uh, being involved in Iga at that point in time. So uh, if I had to take one swing in Q2, it's Naomi Osaka. Q3, I took a bet at a much bigger price than it is currently available on Palo Bedosa. I would not get involved at any of the prices that are currently available in this market, but I am a seller on Coco Goff being able to replicate the success we saw from her last year. I think similarly, Navarro is, oh, is overrated, Krachikova overrated, Svitolina overrated, um, and uh, Bedosa has a pretty clean path uh, to go deep into this tournament. My uh, other kind of names that I circled as I broke down the draw, uh, Vika Azarenka is somewhat overlooked here at 20 to 1 to win this quarter is a huge number. Um, but uh, Q2 and Q3, if there's like a true shock surprise, never heard of this player before. How did they get here? That's where they're coming from. Q4, I have an absolutely absurd percentage of time that Arena Sabalenka wins this quarter. She is the class by margin here. And uh, I think she showed you the best tennis uh, on the hard court swing to this point in North America. Uh, and uh, again, like in the absolute blind, uh, she would probably be my pick to uh, to win the title. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. She certainly seems like the form player. Um, kind of weaving into the outright. Uh, so I've been paying as much attention to tennis lately. I've had my head in baseball, soccer, <laughs> or, uh, just as someone who is, you know, a aware of what is uh, typically transpiring, but is not deep in the weeds at the moment. What leaps out to me is one that Rabakina is twelve to one to win the U.S. Open after yeah. you know frequently being in the five to six to one range. Secondly, that Ostapenko is twenty to one and to win her quarter, and, or sixteen to one to win her quarter, and then eighty to one when it felt like two months ago or whatever she was on track to win Wimbledon. Um, what has happened to Ostapenko? Uh, she forgot how to tennis. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't she do that joking. and then she remembers how and she kind of goes through these I, 
she's much more of a mercurial roller coaster where success kind of leads it to success from what I, my experience with her uh and uh yeah i think like realistically like uh this draw is, is just gnarly <laughs> uh and you know one of the yeah the, the the huge one of the huge reasons that uh that she is that price uh to go deep is because uh She's probably losing in round one. <laughs> this is a not, this is a nasty matchup for her. Uh, just dirty business to uh, um, to try to navigate uh, uh, this draw uh, in her current form, as far as I can tell you. So, yeah, you know, if she beats Osaka, she's going to be a favorite against Mukova. Likely, she'll be a favorite against Lila Fernandez, probably, uh, and she would be a dog against whoever comes out of the bottom half of that draw, probably, but maybe not. I mean, if it's a surprise, because you know the bottom of her little subsection there with Paulini and Drescu, Pliskova, uh, and Putin Seva, like yeah, you know, like none of those players are like realistically going to make deep runs, but they're all players you don't want to see on a given day. So if Ostapenko comes out of section four and ultimately makes a quarterfinal, I don't think any of us should be surprised, but I personally like Osaka quite a lot in that match. And then I like the path that opens up for Osaka thereafter. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, and where are we as a society on Zinwin Zhang, who um, yeah. I think for now a couple of years, for a couple <laughs> of years, it's felt like, you know, she's the type of player who is, you know, she will win a slam. She will get into yeah. the top five in the world at some point. And then yeah. she gets to the Australian Open final and gets um, hammered by Sabalenka. Um, has she flashed that kind of elite, absolutely elite high-end ceiling play or is she still a little while away? No, she has. She okay. will get into the world top five, maybe top three. Uh, she will win a slam. Uh, I don't think it's this slam. Uh, but uh, she... Uh, She's coming off a gold medal run, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> she was your gold medal winner. And I know she uh, she answered my most sincere criticism of her at the Olympics specifically, which was when she went up against the, the other elite women on tour, her record in the last two years, abominable. What you were kind of mentioning about her in the finals against Sabalenka, a lot of that against the top women on tour. And then she goes up against Iga in the semifinals uh, at the Olympics, and she delivered. It was an incredible performance. It was on clay. And then, you know, the conditions at Roland Garros, not that much slower than what we're currently seeing here at the U.S. Open, right? even though it's clay to hard. Um, so she could do some damage here. And in fact, uh, there was a little bit of... Um, I guess uh, like a fade the recent champion type of market enthusiasm for her opponent in round one of this tournament. She plays uh, American uh, Anna Samova, who's a you know, former French Open finalist, I believe, or at least semifinalist. Semifinalist in 2019, quarterfinalist in Wimbledon in 2020. She's only ever made the third round here at the US Open, fourth round at the Australian Open. Um, and she has had a long road back to anywhere close to top form, but she's looked good. Uh, on hard court so far in North America this year. And uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, I think, for people to get involved with her as a money line dog against Zhang in round one. Market was way ahead of everyone. <laughs> they opened that thing so short. It was like minus 150 uh, for Zhang, plus 120 uh, at some places on the open for Anna Samova. And uh, I got involved in Zhang because I just couldn't get there. I, I was expecting we were going to see like two or three to one for Anna Samova in this match. Uh, instead, it was it was just, it was way short. So uh, I'm riding with uh, Zhang here uh, in round one. And once she gets back past Anna Samova, uh, she's got a little bit of a tough uh, potential matchup in round two. I'm assuming uh, that uh, Yuan Ye comes through uh, and, you know, just in general matches a lot of her strengths. But, uh, but Zhang is a, an incredible player. She's physically uh, dominant when it comes to just, like, sh she's tall, she's got length, uh, she's got power, uh, and she can surely dictate a lot of the, uh, the points in, you know, in these matches. And I think she'll beat Anna Samova uh, and, uh, and then ultimately have a pretty clean run to the semifinals. I don't see her matching up well whatsoever, though, with Sabalenka. Uh, deja vu all over again for that uh, Aussie Open final, if that's our quarterfinal in Q4. So uh, for those reasons, I can't get involved with her in the futures pool. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, she has a very unique style of game between the booming serve and then kind of 
well, I'm not sure wonky makes it sound bad, but the forehand is very kind of looping with um, yeah, she's a moon a baller at times, yeah, yeah. A, lot, a lot going on. Uh, with that. <laughs> all right, before we get to the men's side and some matches on Monday, fantasy football season just got better one million dollars better. Create or join a private Yahoo fantasy league and enter the one million dollar NBC sweepstakes, plus earn extra entries to win when players on your fantasy roster score a touchdown during an opening weekend game game on NBC or Peacock, download the redesigned Yahoo Fantasy app or go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Million to learn more. As you all know by now, we've teamed up with BetMGM this season. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all our picks and we'll have special offers for our listeners each week. If you haven't signed up to BetMGM yet, use bonus code BETEDGE and you'll get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's how it works. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using bonus code BETEDGE. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game and you'll receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your first bet loses. Just make sure you use bonus code BETEDGE when you sign up. See BetMGM.com for terms 21 plus only. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S., Call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369 in New York. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP in Arizona, 1-800-327-5050 in Massachusetts, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-981-0023 in Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only, subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code BETEDGE and get your $1,500 first bet offer today. Okay, men's side uh, of the US Open, Monday mm. match. We'll break down in further detail all the men's outright prices, quarter prices mm. and everything on tomorrow's show. But for now, Monday matches are Giovanni. Uh, this is going to be trouble. Giovanni <laughs> and Pecci Perica. Pecci Perica. Uh, Pechi okay. Perica. Pechi Perica. Where is he from? France. He f- okay. Interesting. Giovanni. It's <laughs> not usually a French It is quite there. the name. Okay. All right. Perica. Uh, he's plus Perica. 125. And he plays uh, somehow a much more easily pronounceable opponent in Thomas Martin <laughs> Echeverry, who is minus 160. Uh, do you like anything in this one? I'll be honest with you. Our producer, Adam, was like, hey, is there any matches you want to kick around? I was like, well, Jay's going to have to introduce him. So definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Giovanni. <laughs> Unbelievable. We call him GMP. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a cleaner uh, cleaner pronunciation, oh, wow. just GMP. Uh, although the, the, M, the, M, yeah, the M in Teshi is silent. <laughs> So you, it's right. more like GPP. Uh, that said, uh, I am a huge GPP fan. Uh, I really, really uh, am blown away with how amazing he has been serving the serving the uh, tennis ball uh, since he is bust on the scene this year. He's a young man from France, 21 years old, uh, and his serve impact so far uh, in you know the uh, the handful of matches we've got from him at tour level play is like just it looks like all-time stuff um and i know that like we're on a little bit of a slow hard court here at flushing meadows um but he's playing on an outside court here and i think just in general um you know his service game is very tough tough to match up against and when i go against thomas um Echeverry, it is generally taking on play you know to going on you know taking him on with players who have outstanding service game and uh if you haven't watched this frenchman play before like it's it's worth tuning in for because he he can really you know serve some fireworks uh and uh, i'm excited to see him and play him as a dog in this match because i think he can win this one um and uh you know it's it's he's he's a young player to buy in stock in now just in general um he'll be top 20 this time next year uh he is realistically a guy that's going to make a quarterfinal at wimbledon someday uh maybe deeper uh and uh i think uh, in general kind of the uh, most interesting young european player who most people have not heard of so uh backing him to take down thomas martin Echeverry at uh, plus 125 Okay, I like it. I'll have to get uh, familiar with Giovanni's work. Um, so, Drew, <laughs> little known fact. Um, so, the man who has cost me the most money um, over the journey <laughs> of my life is Jimmy Butler. And it's not okay. even close. Um, <laughs> that's why 
It's why I own multiple Jimmy Butler. Um, <laughs> More than Joe Flacco. Oh, yeah. You know, Butler wow. is Butler is, yeah. Okay. I own jerseys because he is my father. Uh, <laughs> oh, and Omar Jimmy, uh, who across multiple different playoff runs has really cost me. Second is Carson Wentz uh, for reasons that uh, don't need to get into now. Third, uh, and ahead of Flacco, ahead of these other characters, third ever is Sebastian Byers. Uh, wow. which is a very random one. Uh, Wentz is pretty <laughs> random, but, you know, it's Carson Wentz. He's a top two pick. He almost won them VPs of somewhat. He's of some pedigree. Sebastian Byers isn't of amazing pedigree, but he still conspired to cost me an obscene amount of money over the journey. It's just kind of just a lot has gone wrong with Sebby Byers and me. Uh, he is minus 130. Good to see him favoured uh, to win a first-round <laughs> match at the US Open. He's a minus 130 favourite over Luciano Dardry is plus 100. Um, yeah. Now, Sebastian, as I would know all too well, a bit more of a clay court specialist, kind yes. of a mosquito around the court where he zips mm. around. He he gets sucked in because he's like a clay court, but then he's also got pretty good touch at the net. Um, yeah. And he has a lot to like about his game, except for the fact that he melts whenever you need him to come through. <laughs> uh, will he beat Luciano Dardry? <laughs> well, hopefully he doesn't melt because I need him to come through. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to my world. I know, man. I So I laid the price with Baez here, and there's a couple reasons why. I mean, Baez has done quite well uh, historically against D Dardery, and uh, I'm I am in general like a huge Dardery fan. Like Luciano Dardery, I've backed him to win four or five titles this year as he's been in weakish fields on clay where I was like, he's, this guy's got it. Um, he has not come through for me. <clears throat> and uh, in general, uh, he's been wildly out of form. Like I'm pretty sure in Hamburg maybe uh, he picked up some sort of injury uh, and we have not seen him play anywhere close to the level that he was in the late late uh, late winter spring uh, at all this summer. He was toothless against uh, Tommy Paul in Montreal. Uh, he got a win against Tabolo in uh, Cincinnati, but then was uh, a, you know ended up. Um, uh, pulling out of his match against Kobali uh, with uh, some sort of injury and then was uh, just completely run over uh, against Gofan in Winston-Salem. And um, I think pretty clearly he is just out of... Either he is wearing the fatigue of a very, very busy spring schedule as a young player, uh, or he is actually carrying an injury that he's not talking about. But whatever the case is, Baez has not been in form, which is why he's cheap here. Uh, he has had some, you know, a couple of shocking defeats. Uh, I wouldn't really hold any of them up as like, I'm concerned about him. Um, but both of these players went and played in Winston-Salem, lost their first round matches in straight sets. Uh, but I do think uh, Baez with the head-to-head uh, -head record uh, of three to one over Dartery, and just in general, uh, a player who you know he's made run here before, like or he, you know made it to round three last year. So uh, he's familiar with these conditions. I like his game in on this uh, court speed, uh, and just in general, like I'm betting against Dartery based on uh, uh, health uh, question marks. So Baez for me as a small favorite. Okay, I see that Sebastian Baez has accumulated six singles titles across yes. his career. At this point. <laughs> None of them when you were betting him, apparently. Like Really would have liked those six to be uh, nine. Uh, that's what I really needed, but that's okay. Uh, last one, Holger Rune, minus 210 against uh, Brandon Nakashima, who's plus one. Yeah. Uh, what do you like here? Really, really strange match, honestly. Um, I made this line closer to 300, and I have been trying to find ways into this match to back uh, Rune. I think he is likely comes through three one. Uh, I'm looking at you know kind of, you know kind of what is the the right uh, plus EV way to attack this one with that much of an edge on the uh, on the head to head market. Nakashima is a fine player. Um, he tends to get over bet. For whatever reason, every time he's on U.S. soil, people just are bought into him, uh, you know, finally breaking through. And I, I would love to see it, but I don't think it's happening with this draw. I don't think he matches up well with Rune at all. Uh, and just in general, uh, um, you know, I think Nakashima um, has gone up against <clears throat> some elite players um, this this summer and i would like circle specifically his two head-to-heads against andre rublev who is a very similar player to rune in terms of just what he can do on the court and uh he was no match for these guys and you know the the most recent time we saw uh you know uh nakashima out there against rublev he was plus 200 i 
you know, I think ultimately that was a wrong price. That should have been more like three or four uh, to one there. And the fact that he's plus 160 against Rune just doesn't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to play Rune minus one and a half sets. I'm going to play Rune exact correct score three one. Uh, and uh, I don't know that Rune is going to ultimately make much noise because his little section of the draw is extremely tough. And <clears throat> we're going to talk more about the men's draw tomorrow. I don't want to spoil it. But uh, Q3, which plays tomorrow, awesome. So many fun players, so many informed players. It is going to be really, really, really great tennis, uh, not just in round one, but round two, especially. Some of the matchups we're going to get in round two are just going to be flat out awesome. Uh, so if you're going to bet round two, round three, round four uh, on these uh, uh, odd days of the tournament, then uh, you got to watch uh, pretty much all the action tomorrow, or I guess as you're listening to this today. So what is the deal with Runa? Why isn't he better? Because we're like yeah. a year and a half removed from everyone saying like, all right, it's Sinner, Alcaraz, and Runa. And he was, I think his end to 2022, is that when he went completely insane and just wouldn't lose? And now like, it just seems like there's something off. Like, He's never made a Grand Slam semifinal. He didn't make the quarters of any of last year's US Open or this year's um, yeah. Aussie Open, French Open or Wimbledon. So what what is the deal with him? Yeah, so you saw enough physical pop when he was coming up in 21 and 22 to be like, on a, as he's, if his trajectory carries, physically he's going to be there. But even more than that, when he went up against some of the elite competition that he faced head-to-head, -head, he showed a mental... I don't even know what the right word is, but just like a, yeah, a very, like a, the type of confidence that only comes from players who do reach their highest highs. It's uh, like he's slightly insane. There's he's like slightly slight insane. I, that's a polite way to put it. You found it very well, but I was, I was going to say something else, but yes, he's slightly insane. And so the killer instinct that he showed against the elite competition was like, oh, wow, okay. No, he's not going to mentally wilt uh, when he is like, truly up against it um and i still don't think that that's a question for about him at all but the physical side really became a question and uh i would blame scheduling mostly in the year 2023 for what happened uh he has so, sort of like can't say no to a tournament <laughs> every opportunity to play he played uh and this happened to dominic team as well and you know who dominic team is obviously is a former us open champion um but he never really figured out the right schedule for him to keep his body in somewhat reasonable shape over the balance of a long tour season and that's where it all fell apart for rune last year uh after really fighting hard and fighting through injuries at wimbledon he was a hot mess on the nor on the North American hardcore swing last year. He was a first round out at the US Open last year and I think he's solved some of that. He switched coaching teams. He's he he's looks to at least put on a little bit more muscle mass and I think in general like he will still reach some career highs that were kind of in the ballpark of the realm of possibility for him. I don't think he's there yet at all. Like he's probably needs another year of of kind of training and and growth and and just in general like uh, you know, kind of understand how to uh, play tennis that in a way that doesn't like do damage to his body. Um, but uh, once he figures that out, he'll be a force and he'll be a factor. And uh, yeah, he's he's got a ceiling that's you know pretty clear top eight in my opinion. And uh, uh, he just needs sort of the right um, you know the right arc and training and and you know the the right schedule to uh, to keep it from the, his body from breaking down. Okay. Yeah, I see he's 21 years old. So there may be. Yeah, he's quite a young man. <laughs> young, young Holger. He's no, he's no Giovanni Pateshi Pericard, though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> that guy, that guy, he is a monster. Okay. You enjoy watching him at this time. All right. G, uh, MP slash GPP. I'll uh, <laughs> get, uh, I'll enjoy getting acquainted with his work, if not his name. All right. We are done for now. <laughs> Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. If you're listening to us as a podcast, please don't forget to rate and subscribe. And also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From myself, Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, we'll see you tomorrow.